Um, hello. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers of the, not just the AAH conference, but also, of course, our special panel on theatre and visual culture in the 19th century um, for inviting me to be part of what was a really uh, stimulating set of papers on the day. My paper, Time and Again, Staging Pompeii in 19th Century London. Excavations at Pompeii and Herculaneum from the mid 18th century onwards, and the discovery of really very extraordinary objects at those sites of antiquity, of course, so famously frozen in time, inspired a wide variety of literary and visual genres, sensational popular spectacles, and theatrical productions that attempted to recreate its tragic fate. Many of these were focused on the eruption of Vesuvius on that fateful day in 79 AD, revealing less of a picturesque playground for antiquarian activity framed by the shimmering beauty of the Bay of Naples than a scene of terror and destruction. All demonstrate how Pompeii provided a set of malleable themes that could flow into a variety, a variety of ready-made cultural forms. Of course, Pompeii was and remains a site of particular poignant interest. Visitors to the entombed city have always been affected by the uncanniness of effectively walking back in time, while also um, experiencing in the present the resurgence of that past, along with the powerful apprehension of vacancy and of death. It is perhaps in keeping with this contradiction that attempts to represent or reanimate Pompeii to bring it back to life as it rises as a scene of excavation to the light of day are shadowed by the inevitable nature of its tragic end, at once so striking and definitive as though that scene, that spectacle in waiting were embedded in its material remains. Among the many ways 19th century audiences and armchair travelers could experience Pompeii from afar were panoramas such as those created by Robert Burford for his Rotunda in Leicester Square. The first in 1824 offered two views of the excavations of the town as it then looked. The first, a striking coup d'oeil um, as an 1824 article in the Mirror of Literature reported of quote, the forum, the narrow streets, the little Greek houses with their remnants of ornamental painting, um, their corridor and their tessellated floors all are, and I continue, seen as they might have been seen the day before the eruption. The other view uh, in 1824 focused on the tragic theater, the covered theater, the temple of Isis and the small form, so it's a bit more concentrated. Such scenes of the London panoramas in the first half of the 19th century reflect the excitement surrounding contemporary archaeological discoveries, as well as the affective power of ruins and their appeal to the capacity of the viewer to supply additional material from memory or fantasy. Meanwhile, their emphasis on topographical accuracy, as Richard Altick has pointed out, quote, had much to do with the developing zeal for antiquarian authenticity and staging at the theatre. But in spite of their popularity, panoramic representations were criticized for being uncannily static. While viewers might move around within them, they depicted, however fully, just one fixed moment in time, the equivalent perhaps of the dramatic uh, tableau. The same is true of models of Pompeii, such as the large cork one owned by Sir John Soane. Um, though having said that, Richard Dubourg's gallery of cork models was in 1785, allegedly damaged by the model of Vesuvius, ingeniously contrived to simulate an eruption getting out of hand. Overall, though, these depictions were less able to capture what would become such a powerful theme, the catastrophe of the last day in affective human terms to shift from sonography to history and action. The balance of this paper explores how other forms, in particular uh, Bulwer-Lytton's novel and its relationship to painting and to stage adaptation, revive that moment by situating the temporality of human experience through and alongside the creative unraveling of historical time. At the confluence of uh, painting and theatre, a number of contradictions arise around representations of living and lastness and their reception by 19th century audiences.
Edward bulwer Lytton's novel, The Last Days of Pompeii, has been credited with instigating a fashion for Roman novels. Some 200 were written by British and American authors in the period bracketed by the 1820s and World War I, although perhaps the genre had exhausted itself by the uh, 1880s, as Jeffrey Richards suggests. Many were also bestsellers, reprinted many times and adapted for the stage. Bulwer Lytton's recreation of Pompeii made detailed and effective use of the documentary record, using material along with visual and textual sources to convey the fine grained details of everyday life in Pompeii, from clothing to food and a wide range of cultural practices. His cast of characters corresponds to what is known about some of the town's former residents, inferred from records and remnants left behind, not least of human bodies and the objects that accompanied them as they attempted to flee the conflagration. Moreover, his efforts, as he stated, were also to offer, quote, a just representation of the human passions and the human heart, whose elements in all ages are the same. To stage its action as accurately as possible, Bulwer Lytton's reimagining of Pompeii's last day explicitly references locations in Pompeii that had been unearthed in the decades after its, after its rediscovery in the 1760s. For example, the Temple of Isis, the Forum, the Amphitheater, and the Villa of Diomedes. His debt to William Gell's 1832 editions of the Pompeiana, a detailed and extensively illustrated account of the topography, edifices, and ornaments of Pompeii, is made clear at the outset when the novel is dedicated uh, to Gell. At various points in the novel, Lytton pauses and draws his descriptive language directly from Gell. In chapter three of book one, for example, Lytton walks the reader through the house of the hero Glaucus, room by room. His model is the so-called house of the tragic poet, excavated in the 1820s and described minutely by Gell in the 1832 edition of his work. Indeed, Gell includes an illustration proposing how the house may have originally looked, as well as engravings of things to which Bulwer Lytton directly alludes, such as a graceful painting of Leda, which gave the triclinium of this house its name, and the famous Cave Cana mosaic, Beware of the Dog. As Stephen Harrison has remarked, quote, there is a clear resemblance between the two kinds of reconstruction, archaeological and fictional, both using imaginative means to revivify Pompeii for contemporary readership. Harrison also suggests that Lytton's use of comparisons to contemporary life in 19th century England as a naturalization strategy enhances his efforts to bring Pompeii to life, as does his evocative account of his own visit to the region of Naples and to Pompeii in particular, where the novel was written in 1832-33. Here it is presented as only natural that given the context, a writer would be compelled, quote, to revive and to recreate, should wish to people once more those deserted streets, to repair those graceful ruins, to reanimate the bones which yet were spared to his survey, to traverse the gulf of 18 centuries, and to wake to a second existence, the city of the dead. Of course, channeling Walter Scott's famous expostulation in that last line. Not that Scott was alone in thinking about Pompeii in those terms by any means. These are familiar tropes from the many travel accounts published in the period since Pompeii was an important stop uh, in any grand tourist itinerary. And along with the site, the nearby Portici Palace, where many of the disinterred objects had been taken and could be viewed. At the end of his novel, Bulwer Lytton alludes directly to one such object, which the contemporary reader could thus hypothetically see for themselves, the famous imprint of a woman's breast, the trace of the fated Julia, from which one of his characters was drawn. In other places too, Bulwer Lytton takes pains to show how his fictional work aligns with the state of the archaeological data in the early 1820s, sorry, early 1830s. It's a cat clawing at the window beside me. I'm going to pause the recording. You can probably hear it. I do apologize. I'm going to pause it and let the cat in. As I was saying, in other places too, Bulwer Lytton takes pains to show how his fictional work aligns with the state of the archaeological data in the early 1830s, allowing these two temporal moments to briefly line up. 
I think that's a kind of a nice, you know, almost stereoscopic metaphor to be applied there. On one level, the novel moves both backwards and forwards in time, unraveling the destructive effects of 79 AD and thus rewinding while fast forwarding towards the inevitable conclusion. Um, and it's not accidental that the last uh, word of the novel is history. On another level, the frequent referencing of the present superimposes the time of the reader directly onto the time of the story. The last day is not quite the end or the last page of the novel, which as it concludes advances 17 centuries to arrive at how the city appears now, which is in any case our point of access to what it was then. The language used to capture this co-presence of past and present anticipates what would be deployed in the booklet accompanying Burford's 1849 panorama, The Ruins of the City of Pompeii and Surrounding Country, uh, which proposes that Pompeii presents the remarkable spectacle of ruin without decay, a whole city preserved from the corroding hand of time, suddenly fixed, and after being inhumed for 18 centuries, again unfolded, unaltered, to be compared with the drama of human life in the present day. The novel's remarkable popularity was most certainly enhanced by its composite nature, a hybrid of tourist guidebook, archeological survey, and work of history all in fictional form. Thematically, it was much more than that, with its elaborate plot that features love triangles with, between the Athenian would-be lovers Glaucus and Ione, Nydia, the blind enslaved flower seller who will ultimately save their lives, and Arbaces, an Egyptian sorcerer and voluptuary who also wishes to possess Ione and who perishes in the final conflagration. The novel also featured rival religious faiths, Greek, Egyptian, Christian, and a subplot involving a beleaguered gladiator trying to free his enslaved father. With all this complexity and historical interest, it readily lent itself to theatrical adaptation. But before I look more closely at dramatizations of the last days on stage, I'd like to turn to painting and first to John Martin's epic rendition of that moment in time. The destruction of Pompeii and Herculaneum was first shown uh, in William Bullock's museum in Piccadilly, the Egyptian Hall, so-called Egyptian Hall, in 1822 as the centerpiece of an exhibition that included several other works of Martin's, uh, including um, The Bard, uh, The Fall of Babylon, and some other quite remarkable paintings uh, from the period. Um, and an accompanying booklet, uh, kind of like what you would have, of course, at the panoramas, uh, included a diagram and a key to help viewers decode the painting that specified buildings and other architectural elements of Pompeii visible in the distance across the bay. Uh, one building clearly visible is the large theater, in fact. And narrative elements, of course, um, were included uh, in this description and key based on eyewitness, the eyewitness account of Pliny the Younger. Bulwer Lytton is known to have greatly admired Martin's work. In a chapter of England and the English devoted to the state of the arts, he refers to him as, quote, the greatest, the most lofty, the most permanent, the most original genius of his age, who has, and I continue quoting, penetrated the remotest caverns of the past and gazed on the primeval shapes of the gone world. Master of the apocalyptic sublime, in which themes of destruction dominate, Martin's painted vistas are fantastically ambitious in scope, darkly atmospheric, but also detailed in both architectural and narrative terms. These large-scale paintings have been productively situated in a rapidly changing visual cultural landscape that saw innovative relationships form between panoramas, painting, and the theater. And this is the context in which it has been argued they should be understood. William Fever, in his biography of Martin, argues that what he accomplished was without precedent and certainly not in line with the conventions of history painting then promoted by the Royal Academy. Martin, he writes, quote, made no serious attempt to represent these cities as they had actually appeared, but showed them instead as sublimely inauthentic permanent stage sets, which is a great remark, of course, considering how much uh, Martin's uh, work influenced stage design, set design. Bulwer Lytton was inspired perhaps even more directly by another painting, the Russian painter Karl Brulov's The Last Day of Pompeii, um, Last Days of Pompeii of 1833, which he saw at the Brera Gallery in Milan. This painting itself drew from Giovanni Pacini's hugely successful 1825 opera of the same name. I'm going to 
come back to the Rudolph painting in a moment, but I want to just hop to Pacini. Um, this was a drama in two acts that made use of details from recent excavations. The opera was performed. Um, this is this is uh, from this is this image is from the 1827 production at La Scala. It was performed in other European capitals in the 18 late 1820s, including London in 1831. The lavish 1825 production, which no doubt set the tone for later ones, made use of real explosives and at the terrifying conclusion amid a simulated earthquake and lightning. Quote, nine gauze curtains painted with clouds of ash and fire were raised one after the other to reveal the volcano. And lava appeared to flow towards the front of the stage, terrifying spectators. I can't quite imagine how that was achieved, but one can imagine the effect. Making artistic lineage literal, Pacini's young daughters feature in Brilliant's painting, sheltering within the enveloping figure of a woman of Pompeii, the model for whom was or been uh, a lover of both Pacini and Brilliant. In his journal, Bulwer Lytton wrote of this painting. Quote, this picture is full of genius, imagination, and nature. The faces are fine, the conception grand. The statues toppling from a lofty gate have a crashing and awful effect. But the most natural touch is an infant in its mother's arms, her face impressed with a dismay and terror which partake of the sublime, the child wholly unconscious of the dread event, stretching its arms towards a bird of gay plumage that lies upon the ground struggling in death, and all the child's gay delighted wonder is pictured in its face. This exception to the general horror of the scene is full of pathos, and in a true contrast of fine thought. And that's, it's a bit difficult to see, but the um, bird, the, the child is, the child is um, the baby in the mother's arms here on the right, looking down at, um, I guess a pile of a pile of plumage on the, on the, on the, on the pavement, which is not that easy to make out. Both vast and dramatic paintings, so both Brulov's and Martin's, place the human situation front and center, depicting the fragile body in imagined response to the horror of the eruption and capturing the tension as the last day is represented at its terrifying conclusion. Martin's figures, although in the foreground, are diminutive in relation to the natural spectacle unfolding in the background. Let's hop back to Martin for a moment here. Um, while in the Brudeov, of course, it works the other way around, right, foregrounding a variety of human dramas and reactions as buildings and statues collapse around them. These two paintings are particularly good examples of how text, image, and theatrical spectacle coalesce as the drama of Pompeii's destruction and rediscovery is recast across media. Martin also made concerted efforts to accurately recreate the buildings from archaeological documentation available in works such as Gell's. He was moreover directly influenced by the long narrative poem composed by his friend Edwin Atherstone on the last day of Herculaneum in 1821 that juxtaposes vignettes of individuals caught up in the disaster and the abject horror of their deaths with just the destructive power of Vesuvius in eruption. And both of these paintings are roughly contemporaneous with the fireworks displays in Vauxhall Gardens in 1821 that included simulated eruptions of Vesuvius. Of course, that's a kind of, um, uh, you know, spectacle that was uh, attempted in, in many locations. These paintings are, as I've sketched out, usually credited with inspiring Bulwer Lytton, whose novel in turn inspired yet more painting. Um, Jeffrey Richards, in his study of the ancient world on the Victorian and Edwardian stage, states that some 35 paintings based on episodes in the novel are recorded in the 60 years after its appearance, including um, John Falconer Poole's The Destruction of Pompeii, um, this very famous painting, of course, Edward John Pointer's Faithful Un to death, which features the legendary figure of the Roman sentry who remains at his post amid the crashing elements as Bulwer Lytton characterizes his plight in book five, chapter six. And that's an anecdote deriving from the discovery, the alleged discovery of a skeleton with soldiers, weapons and accoutrement outside the Herculaneum gate. And Lawrence Alma Tadema's Glaucus and Nydia, which imagines an intimate moment between these two characters, drawing from book two, chapter four of the novel. 
Richards suggests that such works resonated with the aims of the novel and with the ancient world genre as a whole, with its attention to, quote, archaeological authenticity, emotional truth, visual power, and a desire to educate as well as to entertain, all of which carried over into stage adaptations of the major novels. What's also clear, I think, is that putting aside the attractions of the volcano entertainments explored by Nicholas Daly, at once political and religious, as well as deeply historical, these works embody across time the impact on the human body, where, as it were, ash meets bone. Sculptural works are perhaps particularly adept at this material re-embodiment with the American sculptor Randolph Rogers, Nydia the Blind Girl of Pompeii, um, or Giovanni Maria Benzoni's The Pompeians, Flight from Pompeii, as prime and well-known examples. Bulwer-Lytton's novel was adapted for the stage several times in the 19th century. The first occasion was immediately after it appeared. In December of 1834, it was adapted and produced in a three-act drama by J.B. Buckstone at the Adelphi Theatre called The Last Days of Pompeii, or 1700 years ago. The production was praised unambiguously, in line perhaps with Martin Meisel in realization, or what, what Martin Meisel characterizes in realizations as an emphasis on pictorialism and an orientation towards the creation of effects in 19th century drama generally, as well as in fiction and poetry. This is a lovely um, stereoscopic view uh, of uh, one of the statues, um, of course, on the theme of the last day of Pompeii uh, from uh, the centennial exhibition later in the 19th century. But this is a playbill for a production at the Pavilion Theatre of uh, Bulwer-Lytton's novel. And what the playbill emphasizes here almost are like a set of mini spectacles, right? Like a sequence of, of uh, settings in, in the fairies um, to, to sort of refer to an earlier paper on our panel. Um, and it gives us a good idea of how the drama was framed for audiences. But of this first production, the earlier one, um, the classically correct scenery, and I'm quoting from the review, the costly and gorgeous costumes uh, were noted by a review in the Morning Post, which particularly stressed the effectiveness of the stage sets in the build up to the catastrophic climax. Among the scenes, those of the seashore with a view of Mount Vesuvius in the distance, the hall in Arbaces's house, the street of the tombs, and lastly, the amphitheater struck as the best. That's again the Morning Post review. The Morning Herald similarly stressed the admirable scenery, quote, in its style delicately painted in keeping with existing authority where it could be consulted. Interestingly, while the review and the examiner admired also the striking and superior scenic arrangements, which contributed along with the triumphant catastrophe at the close to a series of effects of great power and interest, it also contained some pointed criticisms, namely that the substance of the novel, its own noble drama, so much a product of a bonding between personal sympathy and action across the whole, had been largely evacuated by being distilled into discrete incidents, which devoid of their sweeping train of poetical imagination amount to little more than a pantomime of inexpressible dumb show and noise. And there's some phrases in there that I've just plucked out from the review. A competing production was mounted a, a year later at the Royal Victoria of the Old Vic Theatre, adapted by Edward Fitzball under the title of The Last Days of Pompeii or The Blind Girl of Thessaly, also praised for its splendid scene painting by Charles Marshall and for the effectiveness of the final scene of destruction. The third adaptation was mounted uh, in 1872 at the Queen's Theatre, Long Acre. Um, and although the dialogue, which was closely, of course, modelled upon the novel, had not aged well, apparently, the set pieces and tableau uh, created by George Gordon and W. Harford of various Pompeian locations were quite well received. So costumes, objects, and archaeological details had all been carefully modelled on sources such as the illustrations in Gell. Here too, though, the nuances of the novel were lost in a sea of spectacle, which included banquets, gladiatorial conquests, ballets, and of course the final eruption, which was panned in the Daily Telegraph as ludicrous, and during which, somewhat comically, the statue of Isis, meant to topple onto and crush the evil Egyptian Arbaces, failed to do so, among other opening night catastrophes. 
dramatizations of the novel and its seemingly endless spin-offs subsequently moved off stage, largely occupying by the turn of the 20th century amusement parks and pleasure gardens, for example, in James Payne's pirate dramas, popular between 1886 and 1910. Here the novel was distilled into pure spectacle with dialogue replaced entirely by processions, more gladiatorial contests, and of course the obligatory eruption of Vesuvius accompanied by fireworks, all carried out by casts of hundreds with the support of archaeologically accurate sets and costumes. Um, and this is, I'm drawing from Jeffrey Richards, um, some of these details, uh, which in some cases were, draw, were, were drawn from uh, or realizations of famous paintings such as Pointer's Faithful Unto Death with its carefully depicted uh, soldier's costume. Here indeed, the sublime to borrow Martin Meisel's formulation had become hopelessly material, or rather the increasing material illusionism of the theater had run fully into the territory of the ridiculous. Here are some more images of those, uh, of those productions. The last day was never really last or never only the last, but was endlessly commodifiable and endlessly repeatable. As the proliferation of less high-minded adaptations in the 19th century reveals from the very last days of Pompeii, a popular burlesque by Robert Rees at the Vaudeville Theatre on the Strand in 1872, to quote the last days of Pompeii every Saturday evening uh, performed at the Alexandra Palace in 1898, this inevitable state of affairs is somewhat comic. But a more intriguing tension underlies this. Michael Booth has succinctly observed that, quote, in the development of the spectacle style on the 19th century stage that reflected and forged an increasingly close relationship between theater and painting, among other intermedial relationships, one finds evidently enough, I think, a social and cultural microcosm of the age. Nicholas Daly's research on the popularity of the volcano disaster narrative suggests that audiences did and do take a particular pleasure from them. And in addition to the cultural impact of the theories of the sublime, I guess the obvious reference points here might be Freud's death drive, perhaps also the compulsion to repeat, um, though uh, in Daly's case, he reads them also in the context of, you know, the river of humanity, i.e. the urban masses and the potentially revolutionary metaphorics of volcanic pyrotechnics. As is commonly asserted, spectacles and narratives of Pompeii in particular held up a mirror to 19th century society, just as Bulwer Lytton's novel offered a vivid portrait of a society and its political, religious, and cultural systems undergoing profound change and a warning perhaps about the dangers of decadence and complacency. Perhaps to this list, one might add a certain anxiety about historical time, so that the inherent contradiction between destruction and repetition played out in media forms that are themselves inevitably historical, and indeed, as Anders Ekstrom shows, reinforced by the process of remediation itself. So not only to reconnect the old and the new, but also to refract and multiply temporality. Considering the difficulty, however, of staging Pompeii adequately in the theater, at least if one finds that the emphasis on sensational pictorialism doesn't capture the whole picture, and perhaps another takeaway is that the magic of Pompeii derives from the admixture of its own pictorial nature, its uncanny fixedness, and the urge we still feel with the new media we have at hand to reanimate it. But to continue <laughs> ad nauseum, perhaps reanimating. Pompeii re-experiencing its last days. Okay, so this is where the paper ends. Thank you very much for your for your patience and attention, and especially for the interruption for uh, cat uh, cat entry. Thanks. <laughs>